Pomona College is a place of natural beauty, nestled at the base of Mount Baldy, set amid the sacred oak trees that have stood for centuries. As we begin this celebration of the college and its history, we honor and recognize the first peoples whose ancestors called these lands their home for hundreds and thousands of years. Our ceremony begins today with a blessing from Kim Marcus, ceremonial leader for the Santa Rosa Band of Cahuilla Indians and a Serrano Indian. He will be followed by Imam Adil Zeb, representing the chaplains of the Claremont Colleges, who will deliver an invocation. Aminat Mir Mir Machumam Chemtewe, Machumam Ibam, Mo Ibam Ipa, Tempo on Piva Ibam Ipa, Machumam, Tempo on Piva Tem Katamika Kitchen Kakawaka Ausnaka, a Chamna Chemtewe Ipa. Good afternoon. I'd like to open up with a blessing of our people from an ancient beginning from the area here. I am Kuya and Serrano, inhabited here in the area by the Serrano and also by the Tongva people. This is an ancient blessing I'd like to offer. If you could please stand. Watch over the school, Pomona University, our president, President Starr, and the people who are present. And you may be seated. Your fight song for Pomona originated from the song from the Kawia people. It was your original fight song that was a melody that they got from the Kawia people, my people, in the mountains above Palm Springs. And this is originally what your fight song is. You can find this information in the Kuya Indians. Puya pu, puya pu, yo mame. Puya pu, yo pu, yo mame. Puya pu, yo mame. Puya pu, yo mame. Puya pu, puya pu. Thank you. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. So we have a tradition uh, in Islam that uh, the prophetic statement that 
if you're not thankful to people, you're not thankful to God. So I wanted to take a minute to thank everyone involved in planning this event for us today. So if you could please raise your hands and clap for them. It's a beautiful day. I mean, what a beautiful day. A day where we come together to celebrate, rejoice, and make history at Pomona College. We make history because we embrace diversity. We embrace one another, and we embrace talent. The first thing that I heard about President Starr was that she was going to be at Rosh Hashanah at, on campus. And I was like, oh, cool, she's into interface stuff. Subsequently, I received an email confirming that she was attending the Muslim Eid celebration. And I again was subjectively more impressed. And then I had the opportunity to meet her family, who are Green Bay Packers fans. And I thought, okay, also very cool. <laughs> and then I had the honor of sitting down with President Starr the other day and we conversed regarding life progressions, current issues, social justice. And we also met again during the rehearsal for this event. And, you know, I've, I've worked on multiple campuses throughout the U.S., and I've, I've met many heads of colleges from uh, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Europe, and they all had great skill sets. And I knew President Starr was intelligent. I knew she had to be exceptional to work at Pomona College. But for the first time in my life, in my travels, I met a college president who was more woke and more cool than I am. You see, I, I thought I was pretty cool before I met President Starr. And then she started talking about superheroes and quoting movie lines. And I thought, did I just get replaced by the new star quarterback? <laughs> so I can say with strong conviction that anyone who meets you on our glorious campus will cherish, respect, and honor all of the leadership components that you embody. And that leadership will be manifested through our collective change. I will now begin our formalized prayer. God, we praise you, we seek your help, and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask God to protect President Starr as she ventures into the challenges and opportunities of being Pomona's 10th president. To shower blessings upon her and her family and the faculty, staff, students, and volunteers that work with her. We ask God to bless and coalesce the entire Pomona community into one unified body that works to continuously increase our educational, ethical, moral, and social justice standards. We ask that you ordain her with the confidence, perseverance, and sense of humor to shepherd us, her flock, to righteousness and excellence. So always keep a smile, even when we feel like there are no more smiles left to give. And to be a beacon of light when we find ourselves immersed in multiple forms of darkness. I mean, thank you, God bless, and congratulations, President Starr. Thank you, Kim and Adil. Good afternoon and welcome, fellow trustees, distinguished guests, faculty, students, staff, alumni, parents, and friends to the investiture of G. Gabrielle Starr as the 10th president of Pomona College. We are honored to have college and university delegates from across the country join us in celebration today. Their presence reminds us of Pomona's obligations and privileges as a member of a community of scholars and leaders dating back centuries, and of the common mission we all have to advance knowledge and learning the world over. Today is Founders Day. It is the 130th anniversary of the founding of Pomona College. We gather here at a time when Pomona is recognized as a leader in liberal arts education. From our roots as a small rural college amidst sagebrush and later orange trees, we now attract the best and brightest faculty, students, staff, and presidents. For 130 years, we've strived to make our mark on the world. We have been committed to financial aid and student support in order to allow tens of thousands of individuals to realize their inherent potential and have access to opportunities that otherwise very well might have been out of reach. 
We have been committed to diversity and inclusion because only if we truly reflect the world around us do we earn the right to shape it. We have been committed to the highest level of liberal arts scholarship because we believe in the power of ideas and that those who generate knowledge are best equipped to teach it. And we have been committed to doing all that we do in a California context, establishing a college of the New England type, but not simply a New England college. Instead, becoming a place that marries the long traditions of the academy with the innovative spirit, rich cultures, and geographic diversity of the West, building an educational institution that sets a new standard for what creativity, engagement, and community mean in the modern world. These commitments represent high ambitions, and our path has not always been a straight one. Our history is dotted with miscalculations, missteps, misunderstandings, and flat-out mistakes. We have disagreed with one another, debated one another, and even occasionally offended one another. Yet this is the nature of building a great community. Just as students must be encouraged to embrace failure in order to grow as individuals, so must Pomona College. And as such, Pomona's leader must embrace both our great ambitions and our occasional failures, guiding us, challenging us, and helping us to build on 130 years of success to continue to grow as a community. Gabby Starr is just such a leader. I first met Gabby in downtown Los Angeles last year as part of a series of conversations with candidates for the Pomona presidency. Gabby stood out from our first interaction. We had, as you might imagine, many eminently qualified candidates for the presidency, and typically they were eager to share what they would bring to the college. Gabby was different. She spent the first 40 minutes of our time together talking about ideas, her scholarship, issues of the day, challenges facing higher education. She asked questions about Pomona and about what we wanted to become. It was clear that Gabby was a selfless intellectual, a pragmatic skeptic, and a globally-minded local actor, exactly the kind of person who should lead Pomona College. And so she is. Gabby's inaugural theme of imagine, create, engage, together, represents the best of who she is and who we all should aspire to be. Thank you, Gabby, for joining us. I know that she will make our mark on, her mark on Pomona College as she continues to support us, engage us, and challenge us for many years to come. I'm too delighted to introduce those who will join me in welcoming our new president today, Eleanor Brown, James Irvine, Professor of Economics and Chair of the Faculty on behalf of the faculty, Sophia Sun, Senior Class President and a Linguistics and Cognitive Science major from Sunnyvale, California, on behalf of Pomona's 1,668 students. Ashley Pauley, Associate Dean of Admission and Scripps College graduate on behalf of our dedicated staff. Matt Thompson, Class of 96 and President of the Alumni Association on behalf of Pomona's more than 26,000 alumni. Maria Clave, President of Harvey Mudd College and Chair of the Claremont College's Council of Presidents on behalf of the Claremont Colleges and Mary Later, Larry Schrader on behalf of the City of Claremont, of which the late Pomona College President Charles Sumner wrote, was the site for the college that was selected with the purpose of building up a distinct college town. Let us begin this afternoon with greetings on behalf of the faculty. Eleanor. On behalf of the faculty, in the presence of so many Sage Hens and Sage fans, I'm delighted to welcome you, Gabby Starr, as Pomona's 10th president. At Pomona, we faculty engage our students in the great adventure of being awash in the world of ideas and discoveries and creative expression, offering up what it means to produce knowledge, to think systematically, in multiple, sometimes contradictory systems, to experience and create the sublime in many forms, to let go and take chances and add nuance to their 
and in the process our world views. Nuance is the reward for daring to give voice to our thoughts and then daring to listen to object objections and to think the objections through. The scary and exhilarating thing about nuance is that we may very well end up agreeing with no one as we make our ideas truly our own. President Starr asked during convocation, can we make stronger arguments, stretch our thinking, delve deeper into ideas, and know that even in disagreement, we still can find peace? When our disagreements are nuanced and thoughtful, when we are united by curiosity and a love of learning, the answer must surely be yes. It isn't easy, though, or automatic. We must first build a community of mutual regard within which disagreement can be a form of collaboration. We disagree with one another. We disagree together. Digging through the archives reveals a likely source of this inauguration's theme of imagine, create, engage together. Gabby once remarked that Pomona College isn't a world to itself or for itself. It is a place where we convene to imagine, argue, engage, and build together many possible worlds. We can only do this as who we are, a community of the curious. Imagine, argue, engage, and build together. I like the nuance in this earlier, wordier thought that invites us to argue and to build together as a community. President Starr, I know I speak for the faculty when I say we look forward to imagining, creating, arguing, engaging, and building together this ever-evolving college we hold so dear. Four years ago, I was an eager Prosby whose favorite question to ask all Pomona students was this. How do you think attending Pomona College has empowered you in a way that no other school could have? I imagine attending a school where opportunities are not only available, but truly accessible, where students nurture each other's intellectual curiosity, and where we are immersed in an endless array of ideas that cultivate the empathy and innovation needed to solve society's problems. As a senior, I can confidently confirm, President Starr, that you have come into a community of the curious and a place full of potential. We were all invited into this community because someone ident identified our potential to, to contribute to Pomona and to the world. And we all came because we believed in Pomona's potential to empower us to achieve our dreams. And upon our arrival, we've continued to be curious about the implications of our learning by asking ourselves, what kind of worlds do we want to build within and beyond Pomona? Upon reflecting on my time here, what impresses me most about Pomona is that how members of our community advocate for the ways that this, this incredible institution can and should um, provide opportunities for all students, regardless of their identities and also how members take ownership to empower the spaces they occupy before they depart. Given my reflections, I have the highest hopes moving forward about what empowerment means within and beyond our community. First, I hope that the intellectual, emotional, and physical labor of everyone in this community is appropriately and sincerely recognized. Second, I hope the next generation of leaders, scholars, artists, and engaged members of society who are educated here exemplify the unique and necessary power of the liberal arts education. Lastly, I hope that our global community engages in enriching and difficult discussions while remembering what former student body president Christina Tong said about how few of us are insulated from the real implications of our discussions. 
After all, the term global community not only characterizes the diversity that is within our community, but also captures the global gaze that is upon us as we set a high standard for how concepts of freedom, intellectual freedom, um, respect, and inclusion should be negotiated. Dear President Starr, I cannot wait to see how you will bring in your deep knowledge of imagination and creativity to animate ideas that build a Pomona that is, as you have said, equitable, accessible, and a truly free civic space that helps our community achieve every part of our potential. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have the honor of welcoming President Starr to this incredible institution on behalf of the staff. While preparing my remarks, I spoke to an array of staff and the theme was often the same. This place feels like a family, an environment where a group of passionate people work to make our institutional values align with the day-to-day -day experiences of the members of this college. At the same time, many express the challenges of often feeling invisible to the larger community. Almost 100 staff contributed to making this day run smoothly. Have you seen them? Did you notice the pride on their faces as they either walked among us or hurried to execute the next step in this day? Most will remain nameless, but I am proud to work among each and every one of them and am thankful for the hundreds of hours they put into making this day perfect. There are hundreds of staff who work at Pomona every day. I wish it was possible to have the names of all of the unsung heroes of this institution scrolling behind me right now, because staff often work behind the scenes assisting in the mission of this great institution. We are not simply people who put in the hours. We are people who care deeply about helping Pomona achieve the values to which it aspires. Pomona is like a complex and beautiful puzzle. We often spend time looking at the entire picture without noticing either the people who put together the puzzle or the individual, incredibly diverse and committed pieces that contribute to the whole. The staff here are individual puzzle pieces who are sold out on the vision of what Pomona can be and how far Pomona has come. We believe in the possibility of this place, and we put a lot of heart, sweat, and yes, sometimes tears, into helping to build Pomona into a place of which we can all be proud. Yes, there are days where Pomona can be the most frustrating and challenging place for us to work, but for many of us, there is no place we'd rather be digging in deep to join the cause and fight the good fight. We believe in Pomona, and President Starr, we believe in you. So welcome to a community of high caliber folks who are proud to walk with you, to struggle and cry with you, to be frustrated along with you, to cheer and to celebrate with you, and to be led by you. In other words, President Starr, welcome home. Thank you. On behalf of the 26,000 member Alumni Association, I would like to welcome Gabby Starr to Pomona College. I've had the great opportunity to speak with Gabby and see her in action. Over the past two days, I think I've been in about 10 meetings with you personally. Uh, so it's been a busy, a busy, uh, powerful week. Where are we seated today? We are in the Mabel Shaw Bridges Auditorium. I always wondered the significance of the name Bridges Auditorium. I think I now understand. The Alumni Association Board is looking forward to work with Gabby to build bridges. The Alumni Board is excited to explore how we can increase collaboration and build bridges between alumni and students, between alumni and faculty, and between the 7C alumni globally. When we build these bridges, we enrich the community for all. As some examples, we recently held an art panel in Culver City. Three professors and 100 alumni from Pomona, Scripps, and CGU attended discussing the role of the arts in the liberal arts education and the arts in Los Angeles. Second, we recently had nine Pomona alumni and parents come back to the career office to provide 47 mock interviews to students. These parents and alumni volunteered their time to share their life lessons with students. Recently, two alumni board members held alumni and new student happy hours in London and Singapore. These examples show the benefit of linking alumni with students to bring Claremont to the rest of the world. One is a student of, at Pomona College for four years, but you're an alum for the rest of your life. I encourage students, fa students faculty, and alumni to participate in some of, some of the new innovative programming 
that the Alumni Association is putting on. Come listen to an industry panel. Share a lead with the job, a job lead with the students. Be a Sage Post 47 alumni mentor. Watch a football game online or, or in person. Come back for your reunions. These are great ways to build new bridges with the college. Gabby, on behalf of the entire Alumni Association, welcome to Claremont. I'm delighted that as this year's chair of the Council of Presidents in Claremont, I have the opportunity to offer my congratulations to Gabby Starr on her inauguration as the 10th president of Pomona College. Ever since the council first met Gabby at lunch, at a lunch last spring, it's felt as though we've known her for years. And in the three and a half months since Gabby arrived, we've appreciated her voice in the council discussions, clear, perceptive, practical, wise, and with lots of common sense and humor. We often say that Claremont is the only place where being a college president is not a lonely job. <laughs> I think it's so much better to be a president here than any place else, to tell the truth. <laughs> we often the Council meets every, almost every month to discuss our many shared projects, resources, and challenges. We benefit greatly from each other's advice and perspective. So even though that we rejoice that Pomona has attracted such an amazing scholar and leader as their president, we rejoice even more that we have Gabby as our close friend and colleague. Welcome to Claremont and congratulations. Good afternoon, and thank you for including the City of Claremont in this momentous occasion. On behalf of the City of Claremont, the City Council, and the greater community, I want to welcome President Starr to Claremont. As Mayor, I now have had the pleasure of welcoming three new college presidents to Claremont in the past few years. Each change in leadership presents a wonderful opportunity to renew and strengthen our town-gown relationship. I was fortunate to meet with Dr. Starr recently. I have read about her extensive accomplishments. I was impressed with her vision, creativity, knowledge, and leadership. President Starr also possesses a good sense of humor. I'm looking forward to working together in the spirit of partnership and collaboration in the years to come. Pomona College and the City of Claremont have a history of collaborative projects that impact not only the colleges, but the community as well. We have partnered to host Special Olympic athletes from around the world. We have co coordinated critical emergency training drills with our staff. And we have worked together on development projects and plans to prepare us for the future. I look forward to continuing the strong partnership between Pomona College and the city under President Starr's leadership. Again, welcome to the city of Claremont, and thank you very much. We now have the pleasure of hearing a selection of poetry set to music, performed by representatives from the Pomona College Choir and Glee Club, and conducted by our own Donna de Grazia, David J. Baldwin, Professor of Music. Tis not hereafter, 
What is love? Tis not hereafter. What is love? Tis not hereafter. Present mirth hath present laughter. What's to come is still unsure. In delay there lies no plenty. Then come kiss me, sweet and My spirit sang all day, all oh, my joy, nothing, my nothing my tongue could say, only my joy. Oh, then evermore, oh, my joy, and spake, tell me, my heart, hide not thy joy. My eyes can hear around, oh, my joy, what beauty hast thou? Show us thy joy, my chance is cruelest. Oh, my joy, music from heaven is sent for our joy. She also came and heard, oh, my joy. What, said she, is this word? What is thy joy? I reply, oh, see, oh, my joy, tis thee, I cry, tis thee, thou art my joy. Last year, much to our delight, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the College, Audrey Bilger, came to Pomona from our neighbor, Claremont McKenna. Sorry, Ira. Since her arrival here one year ago, her presence has been a positive one and fruitful. She has been a tremendous support to our faculty in both their teaching and research, and is establishing herself as an academic administrator here at Pomona. Among her many roles when she was at CMC, Dean Bilger was a literature professor and the founding faculty director of the Center for Writing and Public Discourse. She has published widely, including the book, Here Come the Brides, Reflections on Lesbian Love and Marriage, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Her work has appeared in Ms., the Paris Review, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Los Angeles Times, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. Among the editorial boards she serves on, Dean Bilger is a member of the Ms. Magazine Community Committee of Scholars. She is a past American Council on Education Fellow in the Office of the Provost at UC Riverside. Dean Bilger received her PhD and master's degrees in English at the University of Virginia and her undergraduate degree in philosophy at Oklahoma State University. From a young age, she believed academia was where her best life was possible because the best possible life she could imagine was one filled with books, research, and the exchange of ideas. Every day at Pomona, she is immersed in those things, and every day she offers the college her best work. Fostering freedom of thought, making diverse voices heard, working with faculty to shape generations of critical thinkers. These are all acts that till the soil of the mind, breaking ground for growth and a harvest full of possibilities. Dean Bilger is leading the college's intellectual cultivation efforts with vision and diligence. Please join me in welcoming Audrey Bilger.
It is my honor this afternoon to introduce the two keynote speakers for today's investiture ceremony and extend our deepest gratitude and warmest welcome. Gabby Starr asked two of her closest mentors and friends to share their thoughts with us today. Dalia Yudovitz serves as a National Endowment for the Humanities professor in the Department of French and Italian at Emory University. She is known for her work in the fields of 17th century French literature and philosophy and modern postmodern aesthetics. She earned her PhD from the Department of Romance Studies at Johns Hopkins University. French philosophers on the faculty there, including Louis Morin, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Rodolphe Gachet, and René Girard, shaped the theoretical outlook of her cross-disciplinary approach. Dahlia has spent a lifetime studying questions related to the nature of knowledge and how it informs our understanding of ourselves. She believes French theory is particularly interesting for people who want to ask why and how we come to think as we do and challenge any certainty. Edward Hirsch serves as president of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Edward is a celebrated poet and peerless advocate for poetry. He received a PhD in folklore from the University of Pennsylvania and taught for six years in the English department at Wayne State University and 17 years in the creative writing program at the University of Houston before serving at the Guggenheim Foundation. He is the author of eight books, including For the Sleepwalkers, which received the Delmore Schwartz Memorial Award from New York University and the Levon Younger Poets Award from the Academy of American Poets. His second collection, Wild Gratitude, won the National Book Critics Award. Edward has also received numerous awards and fellowships and was elected a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. His devotion to poetry is lifelong. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for this extraordinary and unique opportunity. Dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it is with great pleasure and pride that I come before you to say a few words in celebration of Gina Gabrielle Starr, who is being inaugurated today as president of Pomona College. She brings to you her extensive experiences as professor and dean at NYU embodying the qualities that Marcus Aurelius described as attributes of great leadership, namely a mature and finished personality that is impervious to flattery and fully capable of ruling both oneself and others. This idea of leadership, of governance based on self-governance, continues to be most relevant today. <laughs> to stand. To stand before you today, for Gabi and I, is to come full circle in a journey that started many years ago when she was an undergraduate student at Emory University in Atlanta. As the director of her honors thesis, and later I worked with her as a research assistant, I had unique opportunities to observe and appreciate her exceptional intelligence, creativity, generosity, and openness of thought. Even more remarkable for someone who started college at, 19, at 16, rather, was Gabi's fully formed character, personality, her maturity and integrity manifest in her wisdom and her self-discipline. However, I take these qualities to be more than the expression of her unique intellect, creative and leadership qualities as a standalone individual. I believe that they also reflect her recognition of standing on the shoulders of others, as President Obama eloquently reminded us on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. The point here is not just to acknowledge the debt of Gabi's exceptional achievements to her parents, her college professor dad and high school teacher mom, 
or to the educational institutions and mentors she enjoyed, but rather to also insist on the fact that the development of creativity, scholarship, and leadership requires deliberate cultivation and self-management through education and practice, and inspires, uh, oh, sorry, inspired to dream and aspire through the examples of others, Gabi has sought to impart this creative capacity to those around her and the world at large. As an example, I recall her daughter's Georgie's sense of wonder in discovering a stone circle believed to be a fairy circle, standing with her hands outstretched, summoning and reaching out for a vision to materialize. I think that she will belong that sense of dreaming to this institution at, at Pomona. I'll say a couple of words about her honors thesis, which was on Yvonne Rainier, a dancer, a filmmaker, and political activist, who I think uh, Gabi, in her thesis, already uh, the work that she did is emblematic of her scholarly excellence. She examined how Rainier's experimental films, theoretical writings, and dance practice led to the discovery of new forms of political expression. She focused on the seminal connection between intellect and change, exploring the creative possibilities of what it means to make a political difference. Gabi noted, and I quote her, that concepts of bodies may be constructed by myths, but they are deconstructed and reconstructed using theory. In so doing, she demonstrated the necessity of knowledge and critical thought for the pursuit of creative artistic practice. Thus, reclaiming the import of critical inquiry to both the labors and the processes of creation. In conclusion, I return to Gabi's prescient remarks on the academy in her thesis as an institution dedicated not just to the production of research knowledge, but also to practice in fostering the transformation of lives through education. And like her, I finish by quoting Bell Hook's inspiring words. I quote, the quest for knowledge that enables us to unite theory and practice is a passion. To the extent that professors bring this passion, which has to be fundamentally rooted in a love of ideas we are able to inspire, the classroom becomes a dynamic place where transformations in social relations are concretely actualized, and the false dichotomy between the world outside and the inside world of the academy disappears. I believe that as Pomona's news president, Gina Gabrielle Starr, Gabi to me, is uniquely positioned to fulfill the vision of the college's founders to bear their added riches in trust for all. Congratulations to Gabi and thanks all of you. I'm greatly honored to be with you for the inauguration of G. Gabrielle Starr as the new president of Pomona College. Gabby Starr will shine on all who, as she charges us in her inaugural theme, dare to imagine, create, engage together. Each of these single word sentences is an imperative, a call to action, and one leads to the next. All of us who follow our vocations, who pursue the madness of our artistic and intellectual callings, must have the courage first to imagine, to envision that which has not yet been envisioned, that which may seem impossible, that which may prove unconventional, unorthodox, unruly. But it is not enough to imagine. We must bring our ideas into being, to put them into action. Those of us who imagine and then create, those who study and experiment, we struggle much of the time on our own, feeling our way in the dark. Eventually, it is necessary to emerge from that darkness to bring the fruits of our solitary labors to light. In doing so, in engaging with others, we initiate conversations, we open up possibilities, and together we form the communities that create real and lasting change. Creativity, what the psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott calls the doing that arises out of being, is at the core of what is most original in us. 
It is at the root of our key discoveries, large and small. Edward O. Wilson writes that creativity is the unique and defining trait of our species, and its ultimate goal, self-understanding. It is the celebration of the unexpected, a deep and mysterious process. I've been writing poems for 50 years now, and I still don't know what poetry is or how to create it. No one knows fully how creativity works. Whether we peek into the unconscious of the scientist or peer into the laboratory of the artist, sooner or later, even the most devoted empiricist comes face to face with the enigma of creative thinking. To create, as the OED tells us, is to bring into existence. Something comes into being seemingly from nothing and nowhere that will have a life apart from its creator. There has always been something mirac miraculous about the birth of outstanding works, says the Polish poet Czesław Miłosz, and a ministry of culture and art could just as well be called a ministry of miracles. Every creative thinker is participating in a voyage of discovery, and all those who create intentional works of mind at the highest level, whether a poet, a mathematician, a physicist, or a composer, utilize creative thinking. Creativity requires curiosity and attentiveness, a gift for asking questions, which lead to other questions, a sense of wonder, a capacity to follow what you also lead. Creativity is also a form of problem solving, where problems are a stimulus and engender other problems. All acts of creation involve hard work, artistry, planning, invention, and experience, as well as an intense immersion in the present moment. Our intellectual and expressive labor, whatever it is, demands obstinacy, disinterestedness, and gusto, a long foreground of learning in a field self-surrender to an idea, absolute concentration, which is as focused as prayer. We commit ourselves to long investigative periods of conscious and conscientious work. Yet there is always a point where voluntary effort, like voluntary memory, comes to an end, and something else, something involuntary, some unknown force has to take over. There is something unconscious at the heart of the creative process, something beyond control and training. Poetry is not like reasoning, a power to be exerted according to the determination of the will, Shelley writes in his romantic defense of poetry. A man cannot say, I will compose poetry. The greatest poet even cannot say it, for the mind in creation is as a fading coal which some invisible influence like an inconstant wind awakens to transitory brightness. The imagination, as opposed to the strictly rational intellect, is allied with dreams and reveries to unconscious mechanisms of displacement and identification, of sublimation, projection, condensation. We go to work on our ideas. The mathematician Henri Poincaré considered the sudden illumination a manifest sign of long, unconscious inner work, and hopefully our ideas go to work on us. This is true in all creative processes. Poincaré also asserted in his essay, Mathematical Creation, that the role of this unconscious work in mathematical creation appears to me incontestable. After a long investigative period, Kekulé solved the chemical problem of the benzene molecule a ring rather than a chain of carbon atoms, when in a dream he saw a snake swallowing its own tail. However, a work formed from intu intuition alone cannot benefit from the rigor of the intellect, just as an endeavor relying solely on logical thinking can seem cold, pragmatic, stale. Henceforward, in using the word poetry, Robert Graves writes in On English Poetry, I mean both the controlled and the uncontrollable parts of the art taken together because each is helpless without the other. It is this incomprehensible yet essential interaction, the dispensation of the rational will combined with an abandonment to the vagaries of the unconscious that constitutes creativity at its apex. 
In addition to this interplay between will and surrender, context plays a crucial role in the creative process. Individual creativity does not take place in a vacuum. It emerges from complex and dynamic environments, intellectual, cultural, social, economic. Edison's or Einstein's discoveries would be inconceivable without the prior knowledge, without the intellectual and social network that stimulated their thinking, and without the social mechanisms that recognized and spread their discoveries. The most imaginative work inevitably builds on, modifies, radically changes, or refutes the work that precedes us. Without creativity, there is no innovation, no progress, no discovery, only stasis, the status quo, staying inside the proverbial box. Creativity allows us to think outside that box, to see the world and each other anew, to feel delight and astonishment, to deepen our humanity. As the president of the Guggenheim Foundation, which awards grants to individuals pursuing groundbreaking work, I have the honor every year to witness the astounding creativity of scholars and artists in over 70 fields. Among this remarkable roster of fellows is the person now taking the helm of Pomona College, G. Gabrielle Starr, a scholar of English literature at the forefront of a burgeoning new discipline, neuroaesthetics. Gabby combines critical and neuroscientific methods to try to unravel the mystery of how people experience works of art that move them. Her innovative cross-disciplinary scholarship impressed colleagues and Guggenheim readers as exemplifying both the rigor and the originality of work undertaken in a truly creative and collaborative spirit. Pomona's choice of Gabriel Starr as his 10th president continues the college's strong tradition of valuing the creativity and co collaboration that she embodies. As many of you know, in the 1920s, this growing institution had arrived at a crossroads. Curbing, curbing, the, expression of, curbing the expansion of the college or permitting unlimited growth seemed the only options for then President James Blaisdell. However, he opted to think outside the box. He envisioned a consortium of college based on the British model which would offer the intimacy of smaller colleges combined with the resources of a larger university. Pomona thus became the founding member of the Claremont University Consortium. As Pomona evolves into a 21st century institution, a reflection of the college's ongoing commitment to innovation, to interdisciplinary study, to openness and inclusion, is its new president, the first woman an African American to lead the campus. We are all aware that this is a perilous time in our republic. The values of art and scholarship are challenged and actively threatened almost daily now, both ideologically and financially. We are under siege. As a result, I believe that the long-standing role of our progressive institutions, places like Pomona and the Guggenheim Foundation, are more important than ever. We must not stand down. It is crucial for our democracy that we renew our broad commitment to all forms of knowledge, especially the liberal arts and sciences. We must maintain our belief in free thinking, critical thought, open debate, all of which are essential to sustaining all forms of creativity, and we need to protect these rights and institutions which will not protect themselves. We need to defend organizations that have an unrivaled integrity and even nobility, if I can use such an old-fashioned word. Upholding their stature, safeguarding their values is a great privilege and an even greater responsibility. As John Behrman once put it in a poem, we are on each other's hands, who care? Pomona and Gabriel Starr are now on each other's hands. And in the years to come, your care for one another will shape not only this institution, but the world itself. Thank you.
Talia, Ed, you have done well by Gabby, and you, as such, have done well by us. I am pleased to introduce our next musical performance, presented by members of the Gidi Kusuma, Pomona College Balinese Gamelan Ensemble.
invite you to journey with me along the path of President G. Gabrielle Starr's career. For many of us, our highest goal when we were 15 was to get a learner's permit and permission to borrow the family car. But Gabby had other plans. She started college when she was 15. Educated at Emory University and Harvard, she's a respected scholar of English literature. But Gabby's is not a direct and narrow route to a predictable destination. A Guggenheim Fellowship recipient, her research examines aesthetics and art from the vantage point of neuroscience. Her illustrious career at NYU, where she eventually served as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, exemplifies her compassionate nature. She co-founded a liberal arts prison education program there because she believes the path to higher education is for everyone. We're fortunate Gabby's path has wound its way toward us. A true sage hen, she is often found talking to students about their research, speaking candidly on difficult topics, or even dancing with the first years on moving day. She remembers people's names and greets us with the warmth of an old friend. I am inspired by her courage, warmth, and wisdom. Gabby's winding path to Pomona epitomizes the highest ideals of liberal arts education. Rather than confine herself intellectually, Gabby asks, why not humanities and neuroscience? Why not Beethoven and basal ganglia? <laughs> why not poetry and the prefrontal cortex? Why not study beauty and brains? Rather than trudging through the narrowing alleyways of or, Gabby travels in the intellectually wide open spaces of and. Gabby's ideas are centered in welcoming the new, the different, the exploratory. That is more than the knowledge of the professor or the skill of the researcher. That is the heart of a poet, an open invitation to travelers. Gabby speaks the language of us and we, an inclusive lexicon that lifts us all. In these trying times, when the differences are used to splinter and divide, when the discourse of national leadership is absorbed with yours and mine, such collectivist generous dialogue is nothing short of a balm. And so it is with gratitude that I welcome Gabby whose path has fortuitously converged with Pomona Colleges. I'm confident that she'll draw our collective gaze to the landscapes we are passing, where there may yet be work for us to do. I have faith that together we will maneuver rarely traversed byways, and that Gabby will lead us to places we have not yet explored. And of course, we who journey know how paths must work, when we travel side by side, hands joined, the path grows ever wider. In this way, we'll wear down the barriers that make the path to higher education narrow and exclusive by speaking the language of us and we. Today, we voice our hope that Gabby Starr's circuitous, extraordinary path will, with the force of all of us sage hens, continue to expand until it is a wide, well-traversed road open to a merry, diverse band of fellow travelers. G. Gabrielle Starr, will you please stand? The Board of Trustees has chosen you to serve as President of Pomona College. Yours is the privilege and responsibility of leading this institution, advancing its mission, and stewarding its precious resources.
Gabrielle Starr, by the virtue of the authority of the Pomona College Board of Trustees, I commit to you this symbol of the high office which you now hold. May your leadership of Pomona College be an inspiration to this community of eager, thoughtful, and reverent scholars as they seek to bear their added riches in trust for all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the 10th president of Pomona College, G. Gabrielle Starr. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey and Sam. I also would like to offer my thanks to the members of the Inauguration Committee, uh, especially Janet Benton, Karen Fagan, and Jackie Slyker, uh, to Sam Glick and our Board of Trustees, especially those emeriti whose decades of service to the college are a great gift, my gratitude indeed. Our faculty and students, alumni, our city, the nations who come here today, thank you. Thank you for the poetry for the music, for the joy and intellectual rigor of the panels, for the exuberance and wisdom you've shared so freely to my family and especially my children, Georgiana and Elijah, some of my oldest and dearest friends, many of whom have assembled from thousands of miles away. You make my heart glad. And to my many new friends here today, I'm so happy to be here with you. So, it's not over yet. Today, I formally assume an office whose holders over 130 years, but one of the finest undergraduate institutions in the world. It is a day of beginnings, yes. It's a day of beginnings, yet it is also Founders Day, a day we look back. Our founders and leaders behind them strove for excellence, yet they knew as human beings they could never find perfection. Their sights were set high, their values powerful and real. Yet even as abolitionist zeal had propelled some of them to the Civil War, missionary zeal led others to found residential schools for Native students, youths who found those places devastating. I've heard the descendants of Native students educated at such places speak of how their forebears were forced to hide language, culture, and ceremony as the price of attendance. This knowledge is sobering, it's painful, but we cannot responsibly or morally look in pride at what we have become, even with what is pride at what has been achieved, without also acknowledging what costs and tribulations have been exacted. So we as a community hold in our hands and in our hearts the words and deeds of many whom we do not know, yet neither knowledge nor lack gives absolution. What we must yield is respect and walk a humble path, recalling we are on the paths we walk because others have stepped before us and let us choose our own steps widely, wisely as we seek our Pomona together. As I speak of our Pomona, I too am walking a path that started long ago. And I'm going to tell a bit of an origin story. Uh, they bring paradoxes about who we are and who we'll be because people, colleges, and generations change. And I'm defined in part by my story, but more than that, I'm determined by it. In Boston in 1850, my third great-grandfather, Henry Whedon, was a freedman tailor and president of the New England Freedom Association. His efforts to integrate Boston's public schools are recorded in the abolitionist publication, The Liberator. Now, 1850 was a fateful year. The Fugitive Slave Act forced local magistrates and police to seize and hold persons claimed as property by any slaver until a deputized federal marshal could return that person to bondage. These were momentous and perilous times, especially for a black man with tenuous footing in this nation. The fear of being repatriated, sent back, returned to some purported home was real then. It is real in a different yet powerful way now. 
That December, a federal deputy came to Henry Whedon's shop. He was looking for someone to work for him. Instead, he got a letter. The cloth is gone, the letter is not. At the time, literacy registered power. It was a statement that black people were human when there was general agreement that we were not. Words showed that we could reason, record the rational and the passionate, and thus they came to full humanity. So in words preserved in the Gilder Lehrman collection in New York City, Henry Reed wrote, December 4th, 1850, Mr. Watson Friedman. Sir, your coat came to me this morning for repairs. I take this method for returning it without complying with your request. With me, principal first, money afterwards. Though a poor man, I crave the patronage of no being that would volunteer his services to arrest a fugitive slave or that would hang 100 ends for 25 cents each. Henry Whedon, 19 Franklin Avenue. He wrote and thereby claimed a legacy for which men and women had died. With pen strokes, he proclaimed loud and clear his own humanity and that of those still in bondage. He claimed a birthright not only of freedom but of voice, a value we at Pomona share. We make our words count. We do not go quietly. That resistant spirit shapes me. He shaped his children and hand after hand in generations. It came to my mother and me, to my brothers, George, Reggie and Harry, my cousins, Robbie and Paul. I share it here with you. My father, Davis, was born in Georgia in the 20s when former slaves and Confederate veterans are about the same age as Korean War veterans are now. His family controlled land, but we washed and cooked and worked as laborers. We're also teachers where violence and forced labor for trivial or supposed offenses were part of daily reality. My aunt nearly lost her job after protesting when a white landowner stormed her class and pressed children to harvest his crops. Such was dad's time. Yet when he was called, he served with pride in World War II. He moved north, found employment in my mother Barbara, was an accomplished educator, a leader of her teacher's union, a really hard negotiator, and a wonderful mom. I'm grateful that even as my parents endured threats of fire bombs at home, as they integrated neighborhoods and schools, they never gave up, and I'm here. <laughs> and it brings me to a place where we all seek to stand strong to be in support of all of our rights, to be an engine of transformation through education. I'm a mom and a wife. I've got a caring, talented husband, John, a man whose history, like mine, is filled with actors who resisted oppression and found their voices, and I'm grateful he and my parents and Law Mildred and Reuben are here today. Who'd have known? Thank you. We're here. Who'd have known it? I climbed the stairs to my office, losing past the oil portraits of presidents past, men with whom I share office and responsibility, but who came from places very different from my own. But again and again, Pomona presidents have fought hard for what is right. James Blaisdell opening gates to women and people of color when others would not. E. Wilson Lyons helping to keep students of Japanese ancestry free from internment during World War II. David Ox to be fighting for DACA and undocumented students. I am proud to be walking the paths that they have walked. I guess I'm a first. Inspiring as the summations of being first woman president or first African American president are for many, they're for others merely summations, shorthand descriptions that box, wrap, and comfortably inventory my presence in such a way as to unfold difference but I'm not here as a carefully presented package. <laughs> I am here seeking to impact the future with every one of you. Each of you, my colleagues in color vest colorful vestment, our honored speakers, our students, staff, friends, neighbors, alumni, parents, all of us are standard bearers of who we are and can become. None of us came on our own steam alone and we're obligated beyond ourselves. Such obligations may seem a heavy burden sometimes, but not if we work together. We're called from so many places, called to form one place. What community do we seek? Let me be clear, I'm not issuing a call to conform, to heave to and submit to whatever forces may be. I'm calling for shared responsibility. I'm calling us for us both to listen and to speak. This, I believe, is part of our calling as Pomona College, 
as we look to the future. The future. I don't have a crystal ball. I prefer Minerva, McGonagall, DeCivil, Trelawney. <laughs> I have a soft spot for Pomona Sprout. Yet the future isn't only about imagining or seeing, it's about prioritizing and doing. Now I can't tell you everything I want for our Pomona today. Many more days will bring many more lessons, more views from each of you, but I want to share just three. Now, by the way, three is a magic number. 47 is two. <laughs> I hereby open the scavenger hunt on this speech. First sage hen to find the hidden treasure gets a lunch at the sage hen cafe on me. <laughs> now, I said I wanted to prioritize three things. First, we've already put a stake in the ground for access. But where do we stand on equity and inclusion? We must make this a place where everyone has the tools to thrive. We at Pona, Pomona insist that opportunity and success must be undetermined by who we are. Yet, we're defined by who we are too. There's a difference between those two base terms, defined and determined. So we say success must not be determined by where any of us came, regardless of where we originate. Coming here must mean we can achieve what is truly great. We're still shaped by who we are. Our identities matter. We own them by our taking language to speak who we are and ask for what we need. Our histories matter. We own that past and our present by hands and minds meet with determination. We go from that to a newly imagined landscape where determination leads to engagement. We reach our hands to each other to refine, to rethink, to imagine, and to create. But let us think, secondly, about why we are here. We embody the liberal arts in every corner of this beloved place. In the old paradigm of learning, the very old one, the medieval one, translatio, translatio studii, knowledge is transferred linearly from one generation to the next. But we do something other than that, something special. Pomona is a place where knowledge crosses disciplines, boundaries, borders to become translational. We continually translate knowledge across people, places, and paradigms and disciplines to change the world. We discover, we create, and every discovery begins with a question, an observation, something that piques the imagination. As a community, we test our knowledge, engage deeply with our fields, our peers, and the world beyond us. We don't close our eyes to critique, to alternate possibilities, to the reality we may be wrong. And the ultimate result is something new in the world. A new idea, a new solution, a new molecule, a new policy, a new work of art, a stronger community. So third, let us consider how we want to engage in the world together as a community, how we want to speak, how we want to be heard on the immense stage that is ours. We have a voice, indeed many voices. What will we say and how will we say it to the world? When this college was launched, the world meant something different. Our place now is different. We must decide together what that place will be. We've stood for access. We must stand for equity and inclusion. We've stood for principle. We must stand for nuance. We are smarter than slogans, smarter than simple binaries, smarter than the world always knows. We can be humble. We can open our voices to the world. We can shape discourse now. Listen to each other hear each other. And please mark these words. As one Pomona, we will realize the future of our own making. Thank you, let's celebrate each other, let's party, and then let's get to work.